Okay, so I already see Francesco and some people there, but I will tell them, wait, because we are going to have the lightning talks in a few minutes. Before that, I'm going to do some raffles. So bear with me. I need to, this is going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to share my screen. Wait, wait. Sorry if I was. So this is my shell, and I, ha I have this. This is the worst idea ever, right? So I'm going to do a live uh, <laughs> demo. So we have some things to raffle. So there are basically books and, uh, and, and some other things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a query to this, uh, to, to this URL. And this is the, I have some headers here with, uh, with the permissions to query. And this that you see here is the alias for the optimal room. So I'm going to get a list of uh, people that is in the optimal room right now, right? So we have, 674 <laughs> Python listers in this room. And uh, I'm going to uh, random choice, I think. Yes, from Python listers. So we're going to do the same that we do in the real life conference, right? So if the person is in the room, I'm going to mention that person in the chat, and that person has to reply. If the person doesn't reply, I'm going to go for the next one, right? So let's try. I'm I'm just copy pasting this to the to the chat, and this is going to be fun. So Oliver, maybe is there? Let let's let's do a few more, and then uh, I have like ten things to give. So uh, let's do a few more here, and I want to see that person replying to me. Otherwise, I will just keep going. Michael is the next one. Sorry, Mikael. Philip, I want to see emoji or something there, because if you don't reply, I have to keep going. I know this is not the same that having like uh, someone throwing t-shirts <laughs> in the stage. Sorry about that. Blame COVID, not me. Christian, no one is replying. That's going to it's going to take forever, right? I think what I can do if I, I don't get anyone replying, I will stop in a minute and then I, I will follow, I will continue that uh, in the chat. Yeah, Christian, one, good. <laughs> we got one. So Christian, you you you're going to get a book. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do a few more, and then basically, if I don't get anyone replying, I think uh, we can continue that online in the chat. Alicia, congratulations. <laughs> um, I'm having fun. I don't know. I'm not sure what's happening with the rest. Oh, Christoph is replying. So I'm going to do one more, and then you have to trust me that uh, I'm, I will keep just using this list that I did a request live, so it's people that was in the room. Uh, and I think I'm going to, I'm going to finish that, uh, the, the raffle in the, in the chat, right? So it's four and two minutes, and if I'm right, we have, yeah, we have a break, right? So we have a 20 minutes break, or oh, 15 minutes break, sorry. And then after that, oh, Francesco is saying something. But... You know what I'm going to do, right? It's like, hello, Francesco, welcome. <laughs> you are mute, I don't know if you, if you know that. But... Yes, uh, I'm just pretending to talk, you know, I just uh, open and close my mouth so that everybody thinks that I'm <laughs> muted. But uh, uh, looking at the schedule, uh, looking at the schedule here on the website, I see that uh, Lightning Talks starts in two minutes. 
at okay. 1605. So OK. So we can have a break, but very quick. I think there is something wrong because I'm looking at the schedule in the in in my Excel sheet and it says 420. Yeah, but on the website. Okay. I think, I think you can start now. Let's yeah, do that. I think we... in uh, we have an internal uh, spreadsheet to know whose session sharing what, and I think <laughs> there was a shift <laughs> that happened at some point with the times. Um, but I that, think we that, should. That's stick. okay. So. It was kind of a lightning talk that I was doing the raffle. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> so I will finish with that uh, in the chat. So I will keep mentioning users and give uh, giving prizes to them. Uh, I'm going to repeat that tomorrow. So uh, and now I'm going to leave the, the stage and give the space to Francesco. Bye. Bye, Nico. So, uh, folks, we start in one minute if you want to have a coffee or, or something like that um, or a beer or whatever, um, just uh, just do. Uh, be quick because we start at, uh, uh, so I will uh, orient myself here so that you don't see, you only see part of my mess, uh, not everything. Um, so. It's uh, uh, 16.04 uh, Central European summertime. We start in one minute, so just, you know, uh, grab your coffee or whatever. And uh, um, we have a full house now. We have a number of people who are um, graciously uh, giving a lightning talk. Uh, we have two people who signed up on the Google uh, spreadsheet that I shared um and i invited them over uh to this lightning talk secret super secret room but uh, i don't see them so um uh, wait a second i remove i see myself in two different places it's uh, a little bit unnerving uh so osvaldo and vinicius if you are around and if you still want to give your lightning talk uh, oh, yeah, Osvaldo replied. Uh, and Vinicius, uh, please accept my invitation to come to the Lightning Talk room and then click on the link in there so that we see you here on uh, on our uh, StreamYard, uh, you know, the streaming platform. I will copy again the link, uh, copy link address and paste it. So there you go. OK, the rules of the games, I, I'm sure you all know them. Uh, you have five minutes or less. And I do have a timer. I don't know if you can see it, but anyway, I do have it. Uh, and I will be brutal and uh, merciless, and I will stop you um, if you run out of time. We'll go uh, in order, uh, and the order of the Google spreadsheet uh, OK, we can actually start. And uh, uh, so let's uh, look at the Google spreadsheet. And uh, the first person I have here is uh, Christian. So Christian, I will bring you to the stream. Uh, I see that you're already, man, you're, you're, you're super fast. You're already uh, sharing your screen, man. I'm, of course, I'm, uh, everything is I'm set up. Can you hear me well? Uh, Oh, perfect. I'm f I'm cool. OK. So wait you a second. Start the timer, I will start mine so I know where that went to rush. OK, so I will put first, I will put your slides on. OK, so they are ready to go. Then I would uh, remove myself from the stream, and I will give you the go. So let's see. OK. So five minutes. Uh, I would like to talk today about Python Chile. It's a community. Maybe you heard about it, maybe not. But uh, yeah, my name is Christian. Uh, well, doesn't matter, uh, but you can find me on social uh, media there. But I just want to tell you this little story. So first of all, Chile. What is Chile? I just want to clarify first that it has nothing to do with Chile con carne, not also the chilies, even though the shape of the country is kind of really kind of saying you that uh, it might be the case that it's because of that. Uh, it's a really long country, as you can see. Uh, if we compare it to a couple of nice uh, 
places in the world, you can see kind of the dim dimensions of the country. So don't be fooled by, about the, the typical maps that we see. But not only that, uh, we have beautiful deserts. We have a really strange desert also that has some flowers at some point. We have colorful cities, big capitals, beautiful national parks, and of course, uh, beautiful mountains. We also have the smallest type of deer, the pudu, as you can see it here, little pudu. Yeah, being a bit silly. Yes, of course, you can learn Python too, little pudu. But the most important thing about is that also we have a Python community. So the scenario in, in Chile was that uh, we had a lot of inactive communities, a couple of running meetups, uh, PyDatas and stuff, uh, but we had a lot of motivated people. So we were brave enough and we decided last year to start with a small conference called PyDay 2020. And a, a couple of details about this small event. We had 12 sponsors for educational institutions, 10 international communities. We had 2,300 tickets, even though they were free, still quite impressive. 700 people joined our Discord server. We had a lot of views on YouTube, and we had a long day of 11 hours for continuous transmission. This is our the, the face of all the people that was uh, organizing that. We are really tired after 11 hours. So what now? The thing is that we, after that, we got so many people in, interested into contributing to the community. So we had new contributors and coordinators. We have a healthy growing community and we decided, you know what, let's do it. Uh, so we decided this year we will do PyCon Chile. And as you can see, the website is already up. You can collaborate and contact us by anything you have there. The conference will be in November. And now I want to have a sub lighting talk. Oh, so it will be a lighting talk inside a lighting talk. Just wanted to uh, mention to you that um, if you consider first language speaker, Spanish is the second on the global ranking. As you can see there, it's even over uh, English, of course. Uh, for this reason, uh, I just wanted to clarify it here that it's not only South America. We have, of course, Hispanic America, Spain, and even Africa with uh, Equatorial Guinea. So yeah, Spanish is everywhere. We are dominating the world. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly mention about this beautiful initiative with many people from all the Spanish-speaking countries called Python and Espanol. You can visit us there in hablemospython.dev. Uh, uh, so if you speak Spanish, please drop by. It's a really nice place to be around. So yeah, that will be it. And I even had enough time. So I will use this leftover minute to maybe to show you that uh, this conference is really nice. If you speak Spanish, you can drop by. The first one will be in Spanish. I'm pretty sure that if we get a lot of traction, we will be able to, to host the next one and maybe make it more international with English speakers. So yeah, that will be it. All right, fantastic. I'll, uh, I'll give you the my applause, my own <laughs> my Thank you, here. Uh, it was uh, fantastic. Uh, claro que se habla español, hombre. Good, and, yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I only speak bad Spanish, so, you know. But uh, um, Chile looks fantastic. So I would say, uh, uh, oh, I have a question already. Can we submit papers in Portuguese since we ha have a few more minutes? No, we, we didn't have this, uh, but I, I, just as a, a spoiler, Python Brazil is doing that and they are being a good citizens, enabling Python uh, Spanish speakers to, uh, to apply. So we might do the same for the next year and maybe we'll be in person so we can maybe meet there. That would be cool. All right. Okay. Uh, I will get you uh, off the stage uh, and uh, I will remove your screen and uh, get you off the stage all right and i will put the other christian uh up onto the stage okay so christian hello sorry about that uh sorry about the mishap i put i picked the the, the other christian i uh, think about picking you but that's okay that's I okay put your screen on uh wow lots of colors all right you know the rules, uh, yep. five minutes, I disappear and you start. I disappear. All right, hello. Um, I want to show something that I quickly did yesterday evening. So this is totally unprepared and, and improvised. There was this workshop yesterday from Imachi Labs about their simplified programming environment that lets kids make these uh, colorful pixel art animations by coding in Python. And they also have a hardware device, a wearable device that can then run these animations. 
and I found that interesting. I hadn't heard of Image Labs before, but uh, it got me thinking. I have actually built my own little device that has an 8x8 pixel display and runs Python. This one. Uh, can I run this Image Labs code on this? So, um, if you were at EuroPython 2019, you may remember this, the pew pew. So, these two are relatives. They can run the same games. I'm a fan of the pew pew uh, project, so I built my own pew pew device. Um, I'm going to share the screen of this device now. Um, so this is still running on the device. It's now a streaming video to my computer, so you can see it a little better. And let's see what we have here. Whoops. Here it is. That is the ice cream demo from the Imagi Labs. Or what else do we have? Is the dice. And by the way, Gil, if you're listening, uh, this is how you roll dice in Python. So you may have seen the, the display of the device is red and green only. It has no blue. So uh, the colors somehow uh, come out a bit odd. But for these uh, two programs, it actually worked quite well. What else do we have? Uh, there is the sunrise demo from Imagine Labs. And here you can see that the lack of blue is a bit more of a problem. You can't really see the sun in front of the sky. That should be blue, but uh, still it's it's running. So what did it take to make this happen? Uh, I can show you my code. So this is the ice cream program that I was running. And this is actually almost unmodified code from the Image Labs uh, web app. All I did was add a line at the top and add a line at the bottom. At the top, I import the library that I wrote yesterday evening and just import everything from it. So I get the uh, Imagine Labs API with this M matrix and the color constants and this animation class and all that. And in the end, I uh, call a function that will then display and, and run the animation that uh, is defined up here. and that's all it needs. So these are the rest of these functions. That's all on mod modified uh, Imagine Labs code. And this is the library that I wrote. It's uh, not very big. So it first imports the pew library, which is what actually drives the display. And then it defines all the Imagine Labs API stuff, including this animation class that can collect frames using the add frame method. And here in this method is actually where the conversion happens from the uh, Imagine Labs API with this matrix with, with RGB values. And uh, that is then converted to the PIX drawing service of the Pew API with the color conversion here from RGB to the Pew palette. And then I define this function to run the animation. Um, it creates an animation if there isn't one, and then just loops through the frames of the animation until a key is pressed. And uh, that's all it needed to run a few of those uh, Image Labs demos. That's all I have. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank Fantastic. I, I do remember the Pew Pews in, uh, in Basel. Mm -hmm. uh, they are great devices, and uh, it's amazing that you build uh, another one and uh, you're writing the code for it. Fantastic, really, really cool, really cool stuff. And also, uh, you know, let's see if we can uh, convince Gil to port his Dragon uh, library onto the Pew Pew so that uh, you I can. Don't know if uh, it's I need to report it. I I would expect it, it to to run unmodified, but I haven't tried. Okay, we'll uh, we'll check. I will check for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was pretty cool.
and uh, uh, I will remove you. And now the next up is Sebastian. We have a, a few people, so lots of interesting talks. All right, so Sebastian, you're up. Your slides, okay. Can you hear me? Absolutely perfect. Perfect. So, uh, Sebastian, you know how it works. I disappear and your five minutes start. All right, whenever you're ready. Okay, um, so I'm here to talk to you about code reviews and my love for them because uh, of COVID-19. We all work from home, so we get less time to be with colleagues. That means less time to share about code, and these things became more important. But first of all, who am I? Uh, I am a data engineer from Numberly. I work on full remote from the country of Taiwan. I love basketball, and as you're about to find out, I love code reviews. So uh, first of all, what, what is a code review? A code review is basically something that we do to get five uh, different things. We want it to be a good exchange with colleagues. It's a learning opportunity for the people reviewing and the people being reviewed. It gives better code quality. It gives you, as the person being reviewed, more confidence in your code. And it allows us to get along together to have common uh, standards, which is great. Um, so who can do code reviews? Easy, everyone. Who can receive code reviews? Easy, everyone. So now that we've got that out of the way, uh, with an obligatory XKCD, let's go to how to do a code review. Um, so before you start, it's nice to get boring work out of the way. Uh, of course, as always, as a data engineer, automating is one of my pet peeves. So automate what you can, flake it, black pie test, whatever. Um, make sure you don't go into a project blind. So Make sure the project has a readme and everything you need to understand it. Know the context of the job. Is it a solo job? Is it part of a, a bigger job? Prepare enough time. Uh, I know we are all professionals and we are always short on time as developers, but we really need more than 15 minutes. And also try to be in a good mood. It helps. Um, the technical aspects of code review, uh, I mean, everyone has their own way of going about this. I'm just giving a few tips. This is not a do all end all manual, but uh, try to make sure that the code is easy to read and understand because code is going to be written once, but it's going to be read many, many, many times, maybe thousands, who knows. Uh, go from high level to low level. You're not going to start bitching about the get method from this API call if something is wrong with the high level code and it's not supposed to be doing what it's doing. Uh, naming, 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 I can't stress this enough. It's super important. Um, uh, as I said, commenting. Uh, also, uh, having a company style guide is really important because you waste a whole lot of time arguing over style. If you just have a style guide to put everyone together, it really helps. Um, uh, suggesting simplifications, security threats, blah, blah, blah. So the usual stuff. Um, what a code review is not, this is uh, a lot easier, you know, uh, no judging. Uh, it's not supposed to be painful. It's not actually extra work. It's just part of your normal work to make your code, uh, you know, work. Uh, it's not a one shot. Don't expect to send your code in to be reviewed, get your code back, do the changes and be done. Uh, there's going to be some back and forth always. Uh, it's not a perfect process. Uh, don't send your code to be reviewed and expect that someone is going to fix all your mistakes. You know, it's just another human who is helping you uh, get better. And uh, obviously, it's not going to be the same for everyone or every time. Uh, as I've said before, it also depends on your mood. Um, so now this is the core part that I really wanted to talk about and why I did this lightning talk. Uh, programmers are not always, uh, Pythoneers excluded, of course, uh, the easiest people to get along with. Uh, sometimes we have uh, you know, our pride about our, our code or we have a, you know, a grumpy attitude because people let technical people like us get away with it. Um, so I'm going to try to talk about how to do a code review like a human. Uh, some of these might seem a little bit extreme, but if you do them, you'll find that it actually makes your job a lot easier. So the first is never say you. Uh, I find this is very instinctive. You always want to say you did this wrong. Uh, but if you always replace everything uh, by we or you just remove the subject, it makes it much less uh, inquisitive and uh, much more positive, and it's much, it, it makes it much easier to do code reviews. Um, if you write your feedbacks as a request, it's the same logic. Uh, you make it easier to comply, and that's what we want in a code review. Um, whenever you tell someone to do something for a reason, always give the reason with a principle, uh, not just saying, because I think it's better. Uh, snippets, especially if you're dealing with someone who's a, a junior or hasn't coded this kind of language or type of framework before. Um, 
if it, there's no snippet and no principle, then you just if it's just subjective, try to just give your opinion. And also, very important, give praise. You know, uh, code reviews are often just pointing out things that are wrong. So if you can say, oh, this is nice, or oh, I learned something from now and then, it's, it's really nice. Uh, that was my lightning talk, just under uh, four minutes. So thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, I've put a few links at the end, and I'll share my presentation with you in the, the lobby or wherever I can share it. So yeah, thank you very much. Excellent, great. Very nice. Uh, thank, thank you very so much, much Francisco. Uh, you live in Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's actually uh, ten thirty here right now. So it's uh, wow. very easy for the Olympics, but a little bit harder for Europython. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's uh, that's fantastic. I guess. Uh, do you? I mean, I guess you're not originally from Taiwan, but no, uh, no, I'm from France. You like it though, I guess. Yeah, it's a great yeah. country. It's a great country. Thank you very much. Fun. I enjoyed uh, my time here. Fantastic. Well, thank you for uh, staying up uh, for uh, for this talk. My and, pleasure. Uh, <laughs> we are, we really liked it. Uh, so next up is uh, uh, Indranil. I I'm sure I'm butchering your name. I apologize. Um, so let's see. Let's see where I can find you. All right. Uh, hello. Hi. So Hi. you can uh, start sharing your screen if you have any slides. You don't have to have slides, of course. With, there is this uh, share button at the bottom. Uh, yes. Uh, so the enter screen, right? Uh. Yes. OK. I will add this. Uh, so again, uh, five minutes uh, from when I disappear. Three, two, one, I'm gone. So hi, everyone. So I'm Indranil Ghosh uh, from the School of Fundamental Sciences, Massive University, New Zealand. So today, I'm just going to uh, introduce a blog that I have been maintaining uh, since last three months. So it's called Introductory Football Data Analysis. So this is my Twitter handle. You can find me here or uh, my website. So again, uh, thanks to Python for this uh, beautiful conference. So I'm really enjoying it here. And uh, yeah, the blog uh, that I'm talking about uh, is called Real Soccer Expand. So I'm a Real Madrid fan, and I really follow um, like the European uh, soccer. So this is the landing page. Uh, uh, this is how it looks. So uh, let me take you to uh, the blog. And uh, yeah, so this website is uh, set up to teach introductory football uh, data analysis to those who are uh, starting new. And I actually started this to uh, like teach myself uh, some uh, data analysis with Python. So like uh, refreshing the skills with uh, pandas or like NumPy, SciPy, and so on. And uh, like. Uh, the user will uh, learn how to get access to open uh, football data, like uh, event data or like some tracking data, uh, the GPS data, and uh, run some analysis using them. And there are some mathematical uh, techniques that uh, I've used here. So like uh, from the fields of complex network analysis or like uh, computational geometry and uh, some statistical analysis. Uh, so like uh, the user will learn how to draw football pitches and some uh, beautiful uh, visualizations. So yeah. So these are the references that uh, I used to teach myself the whole thing. So this blog that you are seeing, I used uh, R Blockdown. Uh, so uh, like the package uh, from R, it's called Blockdown. And uh, using R Markdown, I actually uh, like uh, developed this uh, uh, website. So yeah. So these are the uh, references. So like. Uh, there's a couple of books that I used, like hands on machine learning with scikit-learn, Keras, and TensorFlow. Uh, and uh, the book called Graph Theory and Complex Networks by uh, Dr. Martin Van Steen. And there are some uh, good YouTube channels too, like uh, Friends of Tracking that's maintained by uh, Dr. David Sumter, and also the channel that's maintained by Mecca Jones. And uh, this book, uh, Soccer Matrix by uh, Dr. David uh, Sumter, is like, uh, it's fun to read. You will learn a lot of concepts about uh, data analysis and soccer. And like uh, it's written in such a way that uh, even a layman can understand with uh, some simple knowledge with uh, like uh, soccer. 
and these are the posts uh, the yeah so like start from the bottom actually uh, so the first uh, post is to like uh, i'm teaching how to get open access event data from stasform so it's in a uh, like it's uh, given in such a way that you understand step by step so uh, here i'm just uh, teaching how to uh, like uh, install stasform by uh, by using pip so pip install stasform by and so on so like you will learn how to uh, get the data collect the event data of soccer and like uh, analyze uh, analyze some uh, game for a particular game and so on okay uh, so like you will uh, learn how to draw a pass map a short map and their corresponding heat maps from a particular uh, match for a particular team uh, some uh, how you will uh, like learn how to draw a football pitch using uh, a package called mpl soccer uh, some pass network analysis uh, using the concepts from uh, network analysis and uh, like computational geometric concepts like uh, convex hulls, Delaunay triangulations, and Voronoi diagrams, and some statistical analysis. So uh, keep on like adding more posts, but uh, like if time permits, uh, yeah. And you are always welcome to uh, give uh, feedbacks. And this is the gallery. So there are some good visualizations that can be done with Python. And you might not understand directly looking into the gallery, but uh, if you go through the posts one by one. Uh, you will know what uh, this actually means, and uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, again, this is the reference, and uh, that's the end. Thank you. Wear your masks, get vaccinated, and stay safe. Yeah, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, that was very interesting about soccer. Uh, uh, you, know, you, can, you can imagine. And uh, uh, we really liked it. Uh, thank you. We appreciate your time to prepare this, uh, this short talk. So now we have uh, Nicolas for a Nicolas back for. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <clears throat> a short announcement. So I still have some things to ruffle, and the old way to do that uh, is not working. So I'm going to change that. So I want to say first thank you to Manning that is giving uh, some books, uh, full stack Python security and microservices APIs in Python. We also have some vouchers from No Stark Press, so it's a fifty dollars vouchers. Uh, we have some books from Packet or Pact. I don't know. Uh, there is five different books about Python. So what I'm going to do is I have 10 different things to give. So the first 10 attendees to find me in Wonder Me and, be, and they managed to start a video call with me, I will give you the prize. So you have to find me in Wonder Me and you have to start a video call with me and then I will, I will give you the call. So yeah, get ready and have fun. See you. Fantastic, fantastic, Nico. Uh, we'll chase you. <laughs> um, all right, so back to Lightning Talks, we have uh, Francesc or Francesc, uh, almost like me. Uh, yeah, Francesc, perfect. Francesc, okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, where are you from, Francesc? I am living in Spain, Mediterranean coast. Ah, okay. I am, yeah. In the balcony now, it's uh, too hot outside. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Granada is really hot. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Interesting. All right. So you know, you know how it works. You have five minutes. Uh, I disappear, and mm -hmm. uh, you start. So three, two, one, go. Okay. So thank you very much. So yeah, I I work for Iron Array, um, and we recently released a community edition of our main product that I would like to introduce you. So what it is, Iron Array Community. So our main product, Iron Array, it's, um, it's a computing kernel on top of, uh, of um, compressed containers, which work uh, on Blosk and Caterva. And then we add uh, these uh, uh, computational engines. But uh, we decided to that probably it would be interesting for people to get access to the to the data containers, which are compressed and has uh, good performance. So we decided to release uh, the Iron Array Community Edition 
which is uh, a thin layer on top of Caterva and Bosque. Caterva was introduced by my colleague in uh, past uh, lightning talks yesterday. So which are the main features of, uh, of Iron Array Community? So it's a data store for on disk and in memory. It is designed for multidimensional arrays. It is lightweight. It's, on the, it's only dependency is Caterva. And it has support for types. Currently, uh, flow 32 and flow 64. But in the future, we can, we can add more for sure. It is completely open source. And here's the repo. Um, I will share uh, my, uh, my slides later. So yeah, so as it is, as I don't know, Ray community is based on top of Caterva. It inherits all his um, uh, features. Okay, so whereas other libraries uh, has support for um, uh, for chunks. Okay. Iron Array community supports this double partitioning. That means that when you are trying to get an slice, it, you can you can be mo much more selective in the amount of data you are, you are retrieving. So in general, uh, it is faster to retrieve data like uh, hyperplanes from multidimensional arrays, as we can see here. Uh, it is uh, this plot is about Caterva, but Iron Array exactly the same performance. Now, Iron Array community example. Um, so for example, here we are creating a, an array, which is, um, which is one, th one million by one million elements. So almost, um, it's more than three terabytes, okay? And we design uh, the, the chunks and blocks that are one million by uh, 1,000 by 1,000. And the nice thing about this is that uh, creating this huge array uh, using uh, filling it with zeros, it takes just uh, um, a fraction of, of a second. Okay, and then it is possible also to to assign. So, for example, this row we are assigning it to uh, to a NumPy array. So it is really really fast the way to to create uh, these huge arrays. Uh, here. In the output, we, we see the, the information that uh, for for this um, for this array, and we see that the compression ratio is really high, okay, which is normal for uh, such a big amount of zeros. So one of the uh, of the um, of the secret for for having such a high speed is the leverage in the new C++ tool, which was released uh, one month ago, and uh, yeah, C++ tool also. It's, it's the next generation of blocks and also comes with uh, efficient zero handling, which is important for, for the sparse data. Um, so for example, here it's, a, it's a how Iron Array behaves for, uh, for efficiently storing a sparse arrays here. And in this case, we downloaded uh, an sparse array from this URL here. And in this case, it's, a, it's an array of, uh, of shape 2000 by 2000. 20,000 by 20,000. And the rate of uh, values that are not zero, it's 0.3%. Uh, and we can see that Iron Array, thanks to, to BLOSK um, zero handling capabilities, can, uh, can reach uh, very good compression. And in fact, uh, it's uh, very competitive even with uh, against formats like Matrix Market which is especially uh, meant to, to hold sparse data. OK, so thank you. Um, we, are, uh, we will be grateful if you uh, use uh, our, uh, our um, library. And um, yeah, and you can have a, a look at, uh, at our uh, website in ironarray.io.products. Thank you. Fantastic. That's a really great talk. Um, Thank you. <laughs> just a, a quick silly question: Why Caterva? Caterva, Caterva. The it's, name, you, I mean. you mean the name, right? Yeah. Yeah, Caterva. It's a, it's a Latin word that means like a like a horde of people, typically not not very well organized. So apparently, when Romans were colonizing Europe, uh, they usually had to fight these Caterva people, of, uh, like hordes of people. Uh, like in 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 Spania and and also in in the Gallia, and yeah, it was like um, a war for uh, a lot, uh, 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 yeah, a lot of people which were like loosely 
ordered it, so to say. <laughs> cool. Okay, that's uh, that's quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you again for okay. uh, your talk. Very Thanks. interesting. Thanks for having me. And uh, uh, we move to the next one. Uh, so we have uh, Vinicius. Vinicius. That's me. There you go. So uh, the floor is yours. You have, again, five minutes. And uh, I just uh, disappear in three, two, one, go. Great. Thanks. OK. So this is a lightning talk. Uh, this is about PyBR IS18N, which is translating the Python documentation, in my specific case, for Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, I'm going to tell a bit of a story. My name was, I was already presented, Vinicius Cubiani Ferreira. Once upon a time, before the pandemic, when events occurred in, in place, uh, I actually traveled to Sao Paulo for attending the Python Brazil conference on 2019. And uh, at the stage, they were presenting lots of interesting lightning talks. I hope you expect like this one that I'm giving right now. And there I was at the crowd looking at the talks, paying attention. A uh, photographer caught me in the camera. And they presented about this interesting project, the PyVR 18N, which is mostly focused on translating the Python documentation. They were looking for volunteers. They thought the project was a little bit stale. And uh, after I got home, about uh, two, three days later, I decided to check it out the project because, hey, that's an interesting project. I was thinking about contributing with open source. And uh, I decided to look it up. And uh, the first thing I noticed, it was hard to contact anybody. I didn't know because I didn't catch their names or Twitter or anything like that, not even a name. I thought, who should I find to get in touch for this project? So the first contact was pretty much like opening an issue on GitHub. And then, for my surprise, they were actually interested in getting help. After that, they redirect me to the Telegram group, where I was quite surprised that uh, people sometimes were very active regarding their long discussions, for example, on how it was the proper way to translate deprecated. I remember that. And uh, the magic of translating itself uh, occurs using Transifex or Transif fix. I'm not sure how to pronounce it ex exactly. Uh, it handles lots of uh, CI, CD, all the steps involved. So it's an interesting tool to help translate. If any of you guys want to translate your open source project, this is free for open source. And uh, OK, this is very outdated, this image, onto what has been translated so far. Current currently, uh, Brazilian Portuguese is the third or fourth most translated language in the Python documentation is only behind, of course, English and Chinese, and I believe Japanese. Just recently, we passed French. It's no longer the one of the top five. Uh, we have over about 3, 32%, 33% translated already. And uh, if you speak Portuguese and speak English, doesn't have to be a professional, you can join us in how to translate. Uh, we can actually promise any money or fame, but uh, we can promise some awesome things, like you can join uh, the Python Software Foundation if you work uh, beyond five hours a month, which gives you, for example, uh, the right to vote in the board of directors and other PEP approvals or reject. Uh, what else? You can also have your name immortalized in the Python itself. Uh, if you check the Python, it's the, the Python docs and other repositories of Python, you can see your name in the docs. Uh, but most important, uh, if you want to engage with the community to uh, bring back anything to the community, then working with open source is very interesting. It's a good idea. I find it very rewarding that uh, it's a way for paying for something that we are actually getting for free. Uh, I like that a lot. And uh, to help and to inspire other people, because in Brazil, not everybody speaks or writes English. So to make it available in their own language is very awesome. And uh, in the end, uh, that's one of the things that I find most fulfilling, like uh, to 
sense that you are actually helping other people that you don't even get a chance to meet in person. So that was about it I had prepared. So again, valeu, merci, thank you, muchas gracias, vielen Dank. If you want to get in touch with me, find me in any of these means or even on the platform for this conference. Thank you. Also, very, very good message. Vinicius, really a great message that you gave out. And uh, thank you for all your contribution to our community. That's, uh, uh, that's really fantastic. So uh, next up is Jill. Jill. Uh, Jill, I will put you up. I have a small announcement to make. Um, uh, apparently, we managed <laughs> to break the website, <laughs> the EP 2021 website. Oops. Um, we are uh, uh, we are fixing it, uh, but um, things are exciting right now. So um, enjoy <laughs> enjoy this uh, last few talks, and then I will disappear once we go through all the people and see if I can help out a little bit um, fixing the the troubles. But uh, Jill, you are next. You have five minutes, as you well know. So three, two, one. We cannot hear you, Jill. Uh, we still cannot hear you. I, th I think I was muted. It's OK. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Am I muted now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I am. OK, I'll, I'll assume that I am unmuted. If, if I'm not muted, then I'll. Um, it works out. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so this talk is about like a little tool called Enter that helps helps us make the feedback loop of running tests or running anything faster. Um, I'll show you like this is the usual um, this is the usual like feedback loop of someone developing in Vim and Tmux. So let's say we have a bunch of tests here um, and we want to run them, so we just press enter on the other tab or like in a different terminal, they they are green, that's fine. And then we, we edit this file and we just delete the, file, the, the, the test that we don't want. And then we run this again. And yeah, you see, so like this, this little uh, moving from one file, from one pane to the other, like on PyCharm, if you, even if you use PyCharm, I think you have to like click on the button. So like, like move your mouse, like take your, hands out of the keyboard or, you know, like it's just, it's just, it's too long. It's too long of a, of a feedback loop. So this tool called enter, uh, I don't ask me why. Um, it helps, it helps with like, it's a, it's a little Unix tool. So it just does one thing very well. <laughs> um, you'll be the judge of that. So we just pass like a bunch of file names and it runs a command uh, when they change, right? So find is a usual command that just shows you the, the list of all the files in, in this directory, uh, right? So you can see here, uh, ignore the bycache. Um, so if we run find, we pass it to enter, and then we say pytest run test enter, right? And then if I undo, it ran again, because it knows that the file changed. So it's like, I, I didn't, I didn't move my, my, my hand, I just had to save the file. That's it, right? Um, and the same thing here, right? So like, we can do the same thing. We can, do, we can use FD, which is a Rust find way, way faster, or so they say. And, and we can just say like, run, execute that file. And then when we change here, uh, good evening, your Python, it just, just, just ran it. Amazing, right? That that that's it. Um, install install enter in whatever, however your OS uh, does things. Uh, I I use Arch by the way, so it's just Pacman. Um, that's it. <laughs> okay, sorry sorry, I had lost my mouse. <laughs> no worries. Uh, excellent, <laughs> very useful command. I didn't know anything about it actually. Uh, so I will uh, I will install it. It's uh, it's pretty cool, pretty good stuff. Sure. Thank you so much. 
No so next see. up is Osvaldo. All right, hello. hello. And uh, uh, you can start sharing your screen if you have slides. Otherwise, yep. Um, share screen. You will tell me if you can see. Is okay. Yes, and I put you. Uh, oh wow, hydrological modeling, very cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> all right, you know that you have five minutes, right? Okay. And yeah. I will just disappear and you start three two one go okay so i'm osvaldo Varesi. i'm uh, um, from the university of toulouse here in france but i'm originally from paraguay uh, i'm country located in south america and i'm very very new in python actually i haven't been coding for like uh, maybe one year or something like that i'm still studying it still trying to understand it uh, but I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about my PhD work, uh, which involves mostly hydrological modeling uh, research. And we are going to use um, some deep learning concepts in order to do uh, some predictions that may be uh, a little bit more accurate that uh, hydrological models can uh, do right now in, in present. Um, so first of all, uh, there's a perspective, a big perspective of uh, what is what we can do with machine learning in general, with uh, climate science, hydrological science, climate change, etc. Um, it's a very, very nice perspective, research perspective, because we want to know what is going to happen in the future, right? It's like what, what is going to happen with the uh, with the climate. I mean, even with the forecasting, uh, what is going to happen with the hydrology? Where is going to be? Uh, more floods or more dry periods and stuff like that, right? So hydraulic models are excellent tools that we use in order to um, do uh, these predictions and try to um, do some policy, um, poly develop some policies in order to um, take care of our environment, right? Um, but there is a very, very nice phrase that I, I really love it because all models are incorrect but some are useful, right? Because I mean, we are, uh, I cannot explain in five minutes everything, but it, models have uncertainty. Uncertainty is a source of, of error. So the, the hierarchical models may be wrong, right? But uh, we can improve our prediction using machine learning, deep learning techniques in order to understand a little bit better our chaotic um, air system. So I just wanted to show you two uh, research publications. The first one is a publication from Nature, a pretty, pretty cool uh, paper that it shows uh, here uh, three examples. Actually, it was more. there were more examples, but I don't have the time to explain all. <laughs> um, so the first one, as you can see here, for example, machine learning tasks. The first one is object recognition on an image links to classification of extreme weather patterns using CNN climate simulation data. Secondly, we can see, for example, here, super resolution applications related to statistical downscaling uh, climate model output here. Um, this is a very, very good, good cool thing because we have uh, the downscale um, statistical techniques, we can um, take up the uh, global climate models prediction and use it in the hydrological models to predict what is going to happen with, for example, rainfall or runoff in 2050, 2000, um, um, 2100. So yeah, it's, it's a very, it's, it, it's universally used in the climate change uh, research in order to do the, the uh, what is going to happen with the climate change, right? And finally, the uh, video predictions is similar to short-term forecasting of Earth system variables. So yeah, we can use um, these applications to improve our forecasting weather forecast, right? Because our weather forecasts are also uh, climate models. And you know, this is a very, very cool paper I also picked because is uh, mostly I work with this, um, with these kind of models, it's called SWAT, the Soils Water Assessment Tool. And in this case, they use um, the com 
convulsional neural network um, deep learning coupled with error observation um, that, will, that will be telemetry data in order to obtain better estimations of nitrate and sediments. And with this, we can um, calculate what is going, we can calculate um, the entry of sediments in water, the amount of nitrate that, I, that are in water. And with that, we can, we can estimate what is going to happen with water pollution in the future. So in this case, uh, they use um, some multispectral data obtained from air, earth observations. They train the, uh, the CNN model. Oops, that's my time. Um, and uh, with that, they managed to do a, a very nice prediction of, of the hydrological models. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. Very nice, very interesting how you use, um, you know, deep learning on different, to on different uh, you know, uh, topics or different parts of computer science and applied it to um, weather forecasting for us, which is very cool. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, next up is, uh, is Chuck. So Chuck, I'll add you here. Do you have, ah, yes, you have slides. Okay. Yeah, it's me again. It's me again. <laughs> All right. say, yeah, you don't have to talk. It's fine. It's going to be, it won't be more than five minutes, I think. I think. I think. Cool. So uh, go for it and uh, I'll give you your five minutes. Right. So, um, yeah, what is Ice Cream Sprint? So um, I don't know how many of you have heard about Ice Cream Sprint. And um, it's a very nice thing. Oh, actually, how many of you have heard about Sprint? So uh, we have Sprint Day in EuroPython. We have two Sprint Day at EuroPython. So what is the EuroPython Sprint? Is normally uh, people will go to uh, sit together in tables uh, if it's a physical conference. Uh, of course, online, we have similar arrangements that you would uh, contribute to open source. So. Um, the first time I talk about ice, ice cream sprints uh, with people, I think I invented it in uh, EuroPython 2019 in uh, uh, Basel in uh, Switzerland. And then I invented it. I was like, oh, who is going for ice cream sprints? And then there are people asking me, oh, what are we going to work on? Like, which open source project I got to be work on? So um, first of all, uh, I need to introduce a very important person <laughs> to you. That's me. I'm the founder of Ice Cream Sprint. Um, so what's that? So uh, basically, it's just that I, I, have a, I have a passion for ice cream. I love ice cream. Um, so uh, so if you look at the picture on the top, top left, that is uh, me with uh, a Christian, a good friend of mine. Uh, you know, we, we both uh, go to conference. And of course, uh, you may know him because he is a, a Steve Python developer. Um, um, yeah, we went for ice cream. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, I think it's the EuroPython. I think that's the same conference, if I remember correctly. Or maybe I remember it wrong. But uh, And then he told me that uh, Marietta, another uh, core developer of CPython, and then she also loves ice cream. And then every time, you know, uh, when we go to a conference, we, uh, when 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 every go to a conference, when he get ice cream, he would have to uh, send her a picture just to make her jealous. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so like that, that was the picture that was taken. Um, so it, uh, I... So it's, it's a really, very nice ice cream. I, I can't remember the flavor, but it's a very nice ice cream. So there's also a few pictures like me with my conference friends and my good friends also who go to conferences. And then, um, so not all of them with ice cream and also some random picture of me uh, having ice cream in, in London during lockdown because I can't do ice cream sprint physically anymore with anybody. Um, I miss that. So um, yeah, if uh, if you see me in a physical conference again in the future or maybe next year, uh, EuroPython in Dublin, hopefully, and then uh, I would have a recommendation of ice cream. Uh, I think I already know where's the best ice cream in in Ireland in Dublin. So uh, yeah, usually what happened is that um, you know pay attention to the Telegram when I want to go for. Uh, fabulous, amazing ice cream. Then I would shout in the Telegram group. I would say, oh, ice cream sprints, we want to go. Uh, so why is it called ice cream sprints? Because usually it's like happening uh, at the end of the lunchtime. So it's like after everybody had lunch, you know, already uh, have a full belly, then uh, we would run. Uh, so like kind of, first of all, digest your lunch and then go to the ice cream space uh, place get the ice cream and then run back to catch the first talk. So um, so it really is a sprint. <laughs> so it's not very healthy. Of course, you're running very fast after eating a lot. And then um, 
and then also you know uh, uh, having very uh, you know sweet ice creams. Uh, usually I can't resist. I will go for three scoops. I uh, I won't satisf satisfy for one. I will go for three. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's not very healthy. I gain a lot of weight going to conference, but uh, it's worth it. It's worth it. Trust me. So next time if uh, you see someone shouting for ice cream sprints, then uh, please join us. And I do make friends uh, because you know people just join me for ice cream. We we bonded by ice cream. We make friends through ice cream at conferences. So um, I think that's that's it for me. <laughs> I don't know how I can talk for five minutes for this, uh, but I mean, yeah. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and uh, we'll have to check out the ice creams in uh, in Dublin next year. Maybe a uh, Guinness ice cream. I don't know. We can uh, Do we join the beer cream? and the ice cream together. Actually, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about buying an ice cream machine at home so I can make um I can make you know strange flavor ice cream because I I love strange flavor ice cream. There's like one ice cream that I try is uh, strawberry with black pepper, that is like really really good. And then I try another one is like uh, white chocolate with uh, basil or bas basil like you know the herbs. Yeah. It's, again, like really really good. I don't know, like it sounds crazy, but it's good. So I, I, I may invent a few flavor and then if it's good, then I don't know. I can't bring the machine to Dublin. But, but, uh, <laughs> come up with a machine. <laughs> yeah, I'll be like, okay, at the door of the conference, maybe I'm selling them. I don't know. <laughs> well, you just plug it in. <laughs> I need an ice cream truck for the conference maybe next year. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we are looking forward to that next year. That would be that would be cool. Uh, maybe we can join with the lightning talks. We can have lightning talks as we are eating ice cream or something like that. So that would be cool. All right, folks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, that was uh, that was great. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So we are at the end of the lightning talks, and uh, um, so remember that uh, in a few minutes, in ten minutes actually, uh, we'll have two social events. Uh, one in Optiver, which is here, where you are. And uh, uh, the other one in uh, uh, Brian, uh, Conference Brian. Here we'll have a multiplayer uh, snake game. It's a lot of fun. I tried a pre-release, so it's, uh, it's really a lot of fun. And uh, uh, in Brian, we'll have beer tasting and, you know, it's beer. What? I mean, how can it get better than that? So both are fun. Uh, I'm sure we'll see you there and uh, uh enjoy your break i think we can break five Beer minutes. tasting at 4 p.m that's great let's do it yes <laughs> it's already <laughs> five here from uh, yeah <laughs> it's already better yeah. see you there folks bye bye <laughs>